So uh, I'm actually running about 15 minutes late. Sorry about that, but I'm not expecting there to be thousands out there waiting because uh, it's the holiday series, uh, holiday period. Everyone's out doing things. Merry Christmas again. And it's going to be New Year before we know it, which is incredible. So 2019, we're already planning for the arrival of the first boats and, and uh, looking at all the things that we've got to do between now and then. Um, some interesting stuff coming through on Facebook again, the interviews with entrants, which were done uh, you know, up to 12 months before the start of the race. So keep an eye on those. It's quite fascinating to, to uh, hear what they were saying before the start and then now look at their situation. Obviously, some have retired, some are still sailing. Um, some classic stuff there. Anyway, I enjoy watching them because um, I hadn't seen them myself for a long time. But anyway, um, the... Um, uh, the fleet right now, it's pretty good. Uh, everything's happening smoothly, except maybe for Uku. There's a, a storm coming up there, but Tapio, the back end of the fleet, he's just doing his own thing. Typical Tapio, he's happy out there. He's resigned himself to the fact that it's going to take him a long time to get to La Sable alone. He's saying in June. Um, I'm trying to tell him that, hey, get rid of those barnacles and you've got plenty of time. What's happening, Jane Jane? Oh, okay, Jane's playing with the camera. Um, so... Um, so anyway, yeah, he'll get around Cape Horn towards the end of January, and then he's literally got about 80 days to get here, which is more than enough if he's sailing normally. So there's still a chance. Don't listen to what Tapio's saying. We're all hoping he's going to make it in time. Keep sending him messages and say, Tapio, you've got to be here. <laughs> so uh, we, we want him here for the prize giving. No news on Igor yet. Uh, we're expecting to hear uh, in the next few days whether the operation that he uh, was talking about is going to take place or not. So we're getting a lot of questions from people asking about Igor. Um, and uh, then going on to Istvan. Istvan's steering gear is holding up. His uh, pedestal still there. He had been, he mentioned he'd been thinking as an option calling into the Falklands, but that's absolute last resort. Um, he wants to keep going, so that's his plan. He's got a pretty good weather window. There's a big storm coming in behind him, but he'll be ahead of that, so that shouldn't affect him. So the next uh, two or three days, he's looking okay. Uh, still Southern Ocean, anything can happen down there. He's still got five, six metre seas every day. Um, it's cold and, um, you know, he's, he's uh, just focused now on getting around. This is his uh, third time round, and uh, he's, he's certainly reflecting and remembering everything that happened to him uh, at that time. He met up with um, uh, another uh, another boat down there uh, uh, some time ago, Van de Sale, long, to long story. Uh, I met up with him around about now, where he is now, uh, in 1991. Uh, I picked him up on the radio. I was doing the BOC challenge at the time, and he was about 200 miles south of Cape Horn and hadn't had a sight with his sextant for about eight days. He didn't have any idea where he was. So he had to go all the way around Cape Horn without seeing it, give it a wide berth. But I think he's uh, okay now. I think he's uh, got a sight the other day. So that's probably enough to lead him into the horn and hopefully he'll get another sight in the next day or two and give him a good um, position for his approach and he'll get to see it this time because uh, I know he missed it last time and, and uh, the weather's going to allow him. I think he'll have about 30 knots to go around, uh, something like that, maybe three, four metre seas. It looks reasonable and um, let's see, it, it'll be a southwesterly wind. So watch this space, he'll, he'll be glad to get around, that's for sure. Um, Uku's situation, he's been struggling and we had a really classic situation last night. I went to bed thinking everything's fine uh, and then got up this morning, uh, usual story, and there was an email from one of the radio op guys trying to get a message to Uku urgently about this storm that had popped up about five or six hours before. So, um, so I had a look and boy, it looked really nasty. Anyway, we, I thought about it for about an hour, working out the best options, and then got a message to Uku, told him he's got to get south as quick as he can. And um, I actually put the post up on Facebook, so that's fine. And then literally within 15 minutes of me doing that, um, the new weather model came up and the new weather model changed completely. Uh, so it was a lot less in size. This, originally it was suggesting there was heavy winds over an area about 240 miles uh, north of Vuku and it was gonna envelop him and completely surround him. And then the new model said, no, it's a lot smaller now and it's a little bit further over. So he's still got to go south, which is what we've told him to do now. And he is doing that. He's sitting in the middle of a high pressure system uh, right now um, and can't really go anywhere. But he will be sailing again within the next hour or so, we think. And uh, then he'll be able to make his way south in the preceding heavy northerly winds that's coming up. And he'll, he'll rock it down with that and hopefully just get away from it. But I also just put a post up on Facebook, literally 
10, 15 minutes ago about the difference between the two models um, that, that, that develop the Windy TY program. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute because I've got a specific question on that as well. But the bottom line is the, the, the GFS model, which is used in Windy TY, is suggesting he'll get clear of it and um, it shouldn't be an issue. But there is another um, weather model there and it's called the, um, I only ever use that one, it's got a, a the definition is the, uh, hang on, where is it, the ECMWF, it's the second type of um, computer data that, that develops a model. There's basically only two, in fact I'll answer this question now, uh, and the question was from, uh, it was from, uh, uh, Martin Chikinik from Czechoslovakia was asking which model, wh which weather modeling does the Windy TY use? And the Windy TY uses GFS, okay? Uh, and the other model is the ECMWF. Now, basically, all the weather modeling in the world usually comes from one or two of these models, okay? And where the models get their data from is the, an international organization that that everyone around the world keeps pouring in the data from every little country town and uh, uh, most of the big ships at sea, a lot of the big ships at sea are also official weather data reporting stations. So wherever they go, every four or six hours, they will send in a specific amount of data on barometric pressure, temperature, wind direction, sea temperature if they can, things like that. And all of this input data is put into the, the mix and it comes up with a computer model. And from those two base models, you've got this one and that one, um, all the weather system and weather reporting you see from anywhere, anywhere in the world is coming from one or other. And um, the GFS system could be known as it's a good general system, but if you want fine detail, you would go to the ECMWF model. And if I'm correct, I'm not an expert on this, but um, say predict the wind, uh, I think uses the, uh, that's another weather modeling system that you can get on the, on the app. The, you get the app, you get predict wind. It's using the ECMWF input data, I believe. And Windy TY uses the GFS model, okay, computer modeling data. So, um, so anyway, that's that's basically uh, uh, where it's coming from. And they are a little bit different sometimes, and that's what you'll see on that post I just put up. So, so we're hoping that Uku will be fine. He'll get down south. He'll get around it. He'll lose a bit of time. It'll cost him a day and a bit probably in his progress north. But in the scheme of things, doesn't matter. It's all about being safe and trying to get there. Um, so, uh, and also that post in there, I've got another a guy popped up out of nowhere, you call him GGR family, uh, about a month or so ago. He's a sailor, a lot of experience on weather modeling and everything. Uh, uh, Dr James Tremaine is his name. He's been helping me now. So for the last month, I've got uh, another person to bounce off ideas. And so he backs me up with some of the opinions that we now come to on the best way to get the entrance out of the way of trouble if we need to. So thanks, James. Um, Okay, so then we come to uh, we come to Mark and uh, and John Luke. Uh, classic situation. The race is still very much on. Uh, they're both in trades. Mark's in the southeasterly trades, and John Luke is in the northeasterly trades. They're heading fast north as fast as they can, and um, they're not going to. There's not a lot's going to happen. You've probably seen the um, uh, the weather and tracker update I did this morning live. Um, they're going to be tip for tap, but I think Mark. My, this is my opinion. Mark will probably take out a little bit more on Jean Luc in the in the preceding five or six days, and then eventually Jean Luc will come out of the trades, and he's got to make decisions on where he's going to go. And uh, he can't plan it yet because you don't know what weather you're going to get. But it's early in the season. Everyone's arriving earlier than, or these two are arriving earlier than anyone ever expected in their wildest dreams. Certainly for us. So they're going to be coming up here to La Sable alone in end of January. And uh, it's going to be some interesting tactics, and I don't know what's going to happen. I think uh, it's a case of watch this space. But the reason I bring it up now is because uh, Jean-Luc will break out of the trades first, so he'll start heading up. Then eventually Mark will come out, and he might be as close as, say, 700 miles or so by the time Mark comes out, maybe 800 miles distant or something. Um, there's still a distinct possibility that, that um, someone could make a... Uh, not such a good weather decision as someone else, and uh, Mark can go to windward a bit better. Jean-Luc's got to look after his mast. It's not over yet. Uh, if you look at it on the surface right now, Jean-Luc has got like a you know eight nine hundred miles. I think he's nine hundred and something miles break. That's still not enough, really, to be absolutely certain. So, so the race is still on. Watch this space, and um, uh, you know Mark's messages, his tweets now, are really basic, really simple. He, we like him to give a, give us a couple of day to keep you all involved with what's happening, and he's just sending. 
everything's fine, all good. He's just focused and working hard. They can, you know, you can read between the single line of day if you want to call it like that. Um, Jean Luc's a little bit more relaxed, but a bit boring now because he's he's punch, punching away uh, into the smaller seas, going to windward, trying to hold up as much as he can. Um, so. All moving on. Only a few questions this week. That's great because A, I'm answering all the questions. is running out of questions and B, it's holidays. So we're not expecting a lot, but some interesting ones. Um, Cheryl Lind asks, uh, uh, why... Um, uh, oh, hang on. I can't even read that one. Why the gate? Um, oh, no. Oh, no. Actually, I have to come back to that one. Uh, no, I can't even read it. I'm not sure if it's gate or lake. Okay, scrap that. Patrick Pendrope. Uh, Pembroke was asking um, the boats that have been pitch poled rolled over they had furled head sails up there and um, that cr obviously creates a lot of drag uh, in a in a knockdown or rollover situation and would it be uh, relevant to the loss of the mast well you'd have to say any drag could be um, there's not a lot you can do about it uh, other than having hank sails and I don't think any entrant would make the decision to go with hanks over a furling gear based on the whole rollover situation or or knockdown um, so uh, yeah, so it would create more drag, but it shouldn't be too bad, um, you know. And it's not going to change the the situation. That, that's a case of what you'd call reality. Um, okay, Alastair uh, Sandow uh, has heard me talk about before, and also uh, Robin Davy as well, that we wouldn't hove to in the Southern Ocean. He wants to know why. Just another explanation. And is it just because you don't want to stop racing? Um, well, and, it, and this is a personal opinion again, there's, there's places in sailing and in the ocean where you can and should hove to. Hove to basically does two things. It puts the boat in a comfortable position. Uh, if you want to have a cook a meal or have a rest or, or go to sleep or something like that. And it also means that if you can't progress forward, if you haven't got any sea room or the wind's coming exactly from where you want to go, you might want to hove to. Okay, so it is a very well-defined, uh, very good tactic to use when you're sailing and even sailing in an ocean. But there are some situations where you would never want to hove to, uh, and that's when you've got big seas. And by big, I, I'm talking about anything over three and a half metres. Uh, if the sea shape is tricky, you know, like you think it's going to pressure the boat, because when you hove to, even though you might be fore-reaching, and there's different ways of hoving to, some people will do the traditional, you know, backwind head sail, helm over and just be fore-reaching forward. Others will just let it sort of sail with something up, like a deep reef mainsail and just sail slowly forward, you know. Um, but you're always, in the Southern Ocean, if you've got big seas and you're stopped, you're running the risk of getting knocked down and rolled over because you've got a big breaking sea and you're going nowhere, just forward it, you can get flipped back and so on. So as a general rule, I would never hove to in the Southern Ocean. Uh, maybe unless it was a very low sea and I had direct headwinds and I wanted to go that way, then I probably would hove to. So, uh, so generally though, when you think hove to, you think Southern Ocean in a storm, you think in big nasty seas, you hove to, then it increases the risk dramatically of getting rolled over or knocked down severely, which might damage the boat. So, um, so we're not saying you never hove to, there's a time and a place for everything and uh, each situation is different and the skipper will make his own decisions on what he wants to do and when. So uh, don't think I'm saying, ah, oh, you never hove to, it's dangerous. It's just every situation is different. And generally in the Southern Ocean, I probably wouldn't hove to. <laughs> so I uh, hope that makes sense. Um, the other question uh, <coughs> he mentioned was um, uh, about the boats that are littering the bottom of the ocean. We've lost boats, you know, Loic's boat's gone down, Susie's boat's gone down. Uh, we're not sure what's happened with uh, Tommy's boat, but we think it's probably gone down and Gregor's are still afloat. Um, the, the, the pollution aspect of littering, as I said you know, before, um, it's an accident. Accidents happen. You cannot prepare for that and you never intended it for it to happen. So we can't have the a ship there to pick up all these boats floating around. It's not realistic. It's not possible. Uh, it was never intended. There is, and wanted, he wanted to know whether there's anything we can do for the next race to solve that problem. And the short answer is no, because you can... You can do everything you can to minimise the risk of an accident, but if it happens, there's nothing you can do about it. It's like a car crash, you know. Your car becomes scrap metal. In the ocean, when you have a crash, it, you can't recover it. There's no way to get the boat out and do anything about it, so it sinks. And it's very unfortunate. We, we, uh, we would prefer it didn't happen, obviously. And uh, we're all passionate about the ocean. We love the ocean and so on. But um, if there's any trade-off, you, you could say that all the boats, virtually all the boats racing in the GGR are recycled boats in the first place. 
place. They haven't been brand new boats built for the GGR. So we're using older boats and recycling them. So uh, at least the intent is there. But everyone loves the ocean and we're mindful of that. And it's sad. We're all as upset about everyone losing boats and, and you know making a, a degree of pollution. But it's, it's, it's minor and it is caused through an accident. Um, okay, so Mike Phillips... Um, was just asking about Mark Slat's repair. He thought it was uh, something to do... Oh, no, uh, Mark Slat's repair of the Aries wind vane. Now, you might have heard in the uh, phone conversation we had with Mark that the Aries wind vane is held on the back of the boat by two tubes that slot into the back of it. So if here's the back of the boat, and there's the, the boat up there, and the Aries hangs off the back, it's got two big, fat tubes like that that go into castings. And um, unbelievably, Mark came up on deck on one occasion a few days ago, and the whole of the wind vane is, is wobbling back and forwards like this in relation to the boat that's there. The whole thing goes boom. And so on the circumference of the tube, um, he said 80% of the diameter, the, the circumference of the tube was cracked. So there's only 20% that was actually holding it. And on the other side, it was nearly the same. There's a large area that's cracked. So the whole thing was able to hinge and move. And I was really surprised because I sold Aries for 20 years and they use aluminium tubes. They're really thick wall, and I mean super thick. They're nearly probably three quarters of, uh, three eighths of an inch. So 10 millimeter thick wall thickness, aluminium tubes that are quite malleable and they wouldn't work hard. Um, but for whatever reason, Mark decided to replace them with stainless steel tubes, very heavy wall stainless steel tubes. But you can imagine the load on this going all the way around the world, you know, the torsion of the, the pendulum rudder going and then the ropes and, and a whole number of issues, and uh, slowly but surely, those stainless steel tubes have cracked and failed. So uh, the repair, you can go to Mark's um, uh, phone conversation on SoundCloud, it was last week, and he explains what he did. And uh, the best way I could explain it was that what he's done is he's just propped up the the uh, the Aries. If you can imagine this, it's, it's hinging uh, back and forwards like this. If here's the back of the boat, it's back, boom, boom, like that because the top of the tube is cracked. He's now done some timber supports. He got timber out and bolted things and screwed things to stop the wind vane moving and support the tube so that it won't work hard anymore. And I, he's confident. He said, oh, it'll last forever now. It's going to go fine. Uh, and I was surprised because I thought he may have um, taken the wind vane off the back of the boat, cut the tubes and then... Uh, reinserted them in but obviously they might have got really tight the, the, the old bit inside the casting may have got tight um, but normally you'd think you could actually undo that take the bolt out and maybe bang it through but it might not be as easy as it sounds so and he wanted to keep sailing so all the time he was working on the on the mounts for the Aries it was still steering the boat and when it when you're going to windward there's a lot of torsion so this may not be the last we hear of this mark's really confident he said it's really solid and it's there and this that and the other but there's a lot of load and timber i don't know how he's managed to make the the timber strong enough to hold it he said he, he said to me he said, God, you're going to laugh like crazy when you see it he's obviously got photos and stuff now and we'll see it when the boat's up here um so he's confident but let's wait and see you know you don't want to be losing your wind vane though uh, he's going to need that so um so we'll see how that goes um and the other question that Mike Phillips asked, was there any way that someone might come up with a permanent way to catch water next time? Because water's been an issue. Um, I don't think so. Everyone will have a different take on this. Uh, some of the entrants left here at the start of the race with a lot of water, nearly enough to go all the way around the world. That's one choice. Um, you know, some have got water, water drains on their dodges, but then you get the salt spray and all the rest of it. Um, I always prefer catching water in a, in a mainsail just by um, lifting your boom with your topping lift or dropping your halyard a bit and creating a sag in the sail. Uh, if it's connected to the foot of, if the foot's connected to the boom, and when you come up a bit, it just all screams down to the gooseneck, and you can, you know, you can just pour it off like crazy, or even have a loose bit with a skin fitting there and a hose, you can get hundreds and hundreds of litres in one downpour. Um, so I think people will generally, the entrance next time round, will place a bit more importance in their plans for catching water, because uh, not rocket science, it's not hard. You just got to be ready for it when it comes, and when it comes, it's usually a heap. So. Um, so that's about it. Okay, Malcolm Collins uh, wanted to know why the, there's the boat Nicholson 32 design. He wanted to know why we approved the Mark 10 and 11 version. They're the, the last ones that were produced in that range. Prior to that, there was a Nicholson 32 that had a staggered cabin top, beautiful boats, uh, all the rest of it. But we decided that, that we only wanted the latest version because it's slightly bigger, slightly different hull shape, and same with the cabin top and everything. Not that there's anything wrong 
with the previous NIC 32s. It's just that there's so many of them around. We thought, okay, let's go with this one because it is the latest upgraded version. There's some features which are, are good for seaworthiness, not to say if anything before that was no good. This is like the dishwashing detergent or the or the clothes washing laundry powder when they say, oh, it's whiter than white, you know, new than new. Does that mean everything before it wasn't white? No, it doesn't. It just means that the new whiter than white might be a little bit different. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we just had to make a decision and that's what we decided. And also they're slightly bit bigger, so, um, so that's it. And then he asks, uh, how much and what's the cost to uh, enter the, the next race in terms of extra gear, like the, all your safety gear, your radio, satellite phones, you know, life raft, all that sort of stuff, and entry fees, like what's it cost to get into the GGR uh, without the cost of the boat? And uh, first of all, you need to go to, uh, in the news section of the website, uh, all of the news and my thoughts are in one section. If you go to page eight of all of those news, because they're all in different pages, there's a lot of them, and it goes back to April the 4th. I wrote a story there called Inspiring Since 1968. And if you click on that news, that news there, there's a whole budget breakdown of what it's going to cost you to do the GGR in 22. And basically it runs out like this. If you forget about the cost of the boat and the refit, you will spend about 20,000 euro to get all of the race related gear. And the entry fee in euros is about 9,500 euro. Okay, so near enough to 30,000 euro for entry fees, plus all your extra bits and pieces. And then you've got to buy your boat and refit it. And you could do that from anywhere, buying the boat and refit it for say about 60,000 euro up to name your own price. It depends what you wanna do. So um, that's a, a general figure. And at the end of the day, um, it, it you know all things considered, it's it's it, anyone can do it if they really want to. You know, some people say, wow, that's 100, 120,000 euro or something. You know, that's a lot of money and it is. But if you really wanna do something, there's ways around it. You can do it for less, you can do it for more and um, you know, passion's everything, you know. Uh, so we, we believe it's it's uh, totally achievable to anyone. So good luck, uh, uh, Malcolm, if you're into this. Uh, uh, Dem Adieu wanted to know, um, um, are precautions taken by entrants if they have to go over the side and clean barnacles? Well, I'm not sure. Everyone would do different things. Mark Slats just takes a deep breath and jumps in with a big, big scraper or sandpaper and just gets on with it and does it. A lot of it comes down to your own attitude and weather, what's happening. Um, but the risks are the boat might sail away from you, so you drop all your sails and maybe put a line over the side. Um, sharks are an issue, so uh, you've got to keep an eye out over your shoulder on that. Um, might be a different issue in different places. Uh, and certainly people have got different impressions or feelings towards sharks. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, you want to make sure that once you're in, you can get out again. So you've got a good, you know, ladder, like a boarding ladder, but they all have to have that and, and show that it works so they can get out again. Um, apart from that, when you're cleaning that stuff, you, it's very common to cut your hands, you know, you, so you need good gloves uh, because the barnacles can be sharp, you know, you're cleaning and stuff, so you need good gloves. Um, after that, pretty much common sense. So, uh, but certainly, it's it, the skipper's attitude is everything, and and uh, Tapio's not interested. He's uh, heard a story of a sailor that went over the side and, and radioed to tell people or message people and said, "I'm going over the side to clean the bottom of the boat." He was never heard from again. Uh, boat was gone, person gone. Um, but that's you know, yeah, I wouldn't say that's common, but um, you know, it's up to the individual. So uh, that's it. Uh, Robert Reynolds, uh, he said, interesting, this perception of, of the race, he said, oh, with all this trouble you're having with rudders and ship steering and uh, wind vanes, you know, can you describe to me the different emergency steering arrangements? Well, first of all, uh, the only issues that have happened, uh, Philippe Pesch broke his tiller, which isn't the end of the world, you know, um, the tiller isn't the rudder. So that rudder was okay, it's just the tiller was broken, similar to what happened to Suhaili when he, he lost his tiller under Australia and sailed halfway around the world with a, with a I think it was his winch handle lashed to the, uh, the, the, the rudder head to turn. So uh, we've never had any problem with any rudder on any GRG boat, that's the first thing. The other steering, the other issue has been Istvan steering, which is his main uh, uh, steering pedestal wheel. He's got a bearing issue, which is which he's sort of fixed now, but he mucked up with his emergency tiller, so he didn't build it right. He put aluminium head on the emergency tiller instead of stainless steel. So the ship's rudder is fine. Both there are all human elements there, um, and uh, wind vanes, heaps of issues with wind vanes. That's another story. But every entrant has to have a an emergency rudder 
okay, emergency steering system. And they've used different things. Wind Pilot has a, uh, a, a like a modular bolt-on emergency rudder, and, and all those that had a Wind Pilot wind vane also took the kit that you can put on this uh, small emergency rudder on the back of the boat, and hopefully that'll steer your boat. So that was all approved. That's okay. Um, anyone with a hydrovane wind vane can it, it's its own rudder, so you just you've got an emergency tiller, you just drop in and you can steer the boat through the hydrovane. You don't need your ship's rudder. Um, uh, who else? Oh, on Mark uh, Sinclair, Mark Slat's boat, he's got an Aries wind vane that has a servo pendulum rudder. That remember, it comes up to the surface when when it turns in the water. They've actually got a big blade, so if he had a steering failure on the boat, he would take the um, pen, the normal pendulum rudder off, okay, put this bigger blade on, right, and then the two ropes that come either side of that that then pivot side to side, he ties them off. So now the pendulum rudder can't go from side to side this way, but when the flip-flop vane goes, it still turns just a little bit, and it's just enough to steer the boat. It's pretty basic, but we approved it. So that means he'd have to stand at the back of the boat and just manually push the top of the vane one way or the other way, um, and it would then turn the pendulum rudder. But it, because it can't you know, flip to the surface, it would actually steer the boat a little bit. So, And I think that covers... Um, I'm not sure what Susie had. I think she had something similar. Um, but anyway, they've all got a system and uh, they're all a little bit different. Um, personally, I've got to say, you know, I, I like, as you know, you know, well, I like the hydrogen, there's no question about it. And it's very nice to have that rudder there all the time because your ship's rudder doesn't do anything. You know, you just, just tie it off. So there you go. Uh, anyway, um, that's really about it. So it's a quick one now. Um, not much more to say. Uh, I'm just... Uh, Oh, one of, that's right. one of the questions I had. Oh, that was from um, Cheryl Lind. Part of her question was, who replaces me in 2022? Um, basically, uh, someone will replace me, or maybe uh, uh, two or three others or more will replace me. But I just saw a, a guy, did a, uh, Ellie, um, did an interview with me at the um, uh, Paris Boat Show uh, a week or so ago. So some of it's a little bit out of date already, but he just posted it online. I'll copy that, so you'll see that come up on uh, GGR post and I'm answering a lot of questions pretty pretty down to earth pretty basic on many different issues and one of them is just that you know who's going to replace me in uh, 2022 because I'm hoping to sail in the Joshua class boat and I make some predictions about Jean-Luc and uh, Mark which is sort of still running it's there but that was those predictions were like 10 days ago or something uh, how long ago the boat show was so um, anyway that'll be it but yeah there'll be a few people to replace me I hope <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot we'll um, carry on again and see you again next week, which will be in the new year, which is amazing. Crikey, it's 2019. Okay, thanks for that. See ya.